Give it a ring. John chapter 15 from verse 11. It says, I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy, joy may be complete. My command is this, love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no other than this, that he laid down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants, because servants do not know their master's business. Instead, I've called you friends. For everything I've learned from my father, I've made known to you. And these are lovely words coming up now. You did not choose me, but I chose you. Do you feel that this morning? That you're chosen, that you're called, or because he, he loves you. And he has appointed you to go and bear fruit. I love the next four words, it says, fruit that will last. But if you've been bought any bananas lately, they're horrible. Aren't they? So it's not just me. I thought they were picking on me. I've been to various places and you, you then open them up and you think, oh, right. And they've either been discolored or they're soft as anything. But you know what God is saying here? That, you, that your fruit might last. And that fruit is given to us. Then the Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. This is my command. Love each other. And we come this morning to love and to praise and to magnify him. So we're going to sing a song as we take up tithes and offerings this morning. And we'll start by really worshiping and praising the Lord together. Thank you. And when we come in and we set up a set of worship, we start with something really, you know, to warm up the audience. And we're not going to do that this morning. Because um, it's not my job to warm you up. You're standing or you're sitting on holy ground. Do you realise that? Do you believe God is here this morning? Yes. Holy Spirit, we want to welcome you this morning. We believe you're here because it says in Scripture where two or three are gathered that you're there in the midst. So I don't know what's going through your mind right now. I don't know what your week has been like. Has it been really good? Have you had a good week this week? It's been great. So you struggled this week. This morning, right now, what Paul's just said about how God loves you is so real. It's very special. And you're not here by accident. I'm here by appointment with the King of Kings. So we're going to sing a quiet song to start. Lord, I come. And I want you to think about the words. Have you come this morning? Maybe you didn't want to be here. Maybe you felt you ought to. I feel sad for the people who've decided to stay home today. Because it says, don't stop meeting together. So we're going to sing, Lord, I come longing to know you. And that's what your prayer is this morning, then as, the, as we worship and the Holy Spirit speaks to you, and as we listen to what's being shared, and as Sean preaches, God will speak to you. Isn't that exciting? Amen. Let's stand and sing. Lord, I come.
So there's a petition at the back, which I will tell you about now. You can help stop the violence and stop the healing for persecuted Christians. Uh, yeah, I'll pull that's not what I want. Okay. Uh, the Arise Africa Petition aims to gather voices from across the globe, and we hope, this is open doors, and we hope to take it to the UK government, the African Union, and the United Nations. Add your signature to the global petition, asking that vulnerable Christians in the, in the sub-Saharan Africa get protection, justice, and restoration. Uh, the petition is at the back and in the bucket. Uh, you just have to put your name and sign it. Uh, there is a place to put your address in, but unless you want to receive literature from open doors, you can leave that blank. Although I will say, for those of us who, who on the prayer for the nation rose up, open doors is a very, very good resource uh, for the nations, for whichever nation you're assigned to pray for. Okay, thank you. <coughs> Pray for the nations. This week it's Macau. Um, it's a special administrative region of China. Uh, do you know how many people we have in Worthy? A rough idea. Sorry? 100,000. 100,000. But yeah, it is. It's 100 to 103, run by that size of ball. And they're only seven times bigger. And that's their country. Seven times bigger than what we have. Um, They've only got 32.9 kilometers of land. So what tends to happen in, in those countries, if you look at Hong Kong, it's the same. Instead of going along, they go up. And uh, it makes it uh, a lot different. They stand up in Hong Kong. Uh, some of this land has been reclaimed for the sea. Same goes for Hong Kong. That's, that's what they've done. Their airport is reclaimed from the sea. And they're joined by bridges. Now, I don't know about you, but I've seen some of the Chinese bridges that they've got. And the, there's one, which I'm sure you've all seen, the glass one. And as you stand on it, it appears to crack. And I only have, I've only ever looked at it once, I can't look at it anymore. And then you see other ones where they, they go on, on sort of rope ones. So it's, it's not an easy place to be. 89.4% um, of the people are Chinese and the rest are a mix. Uh, including uh, Portuguese. They're Buddhists by, by religion. Um, there's a very small number of Christians there, about 7.2%. They are Catholic uh, guys. Um, and there's one-sixth of the whole of their population that profess no religious affiliation whatsoever. The place is 100% urban. There's nothing uh, sort of green there. Uh, their main two things are tourism and gambling. And gambling is very, very big over there. And their uh, economy is, is really linked to China, and they're really governed by China. So I was thinking about that 7.2% uh, of Christians. Every one of those is part of our prayer as well. Every one of them, that the Lord will just be with them, uphold them, keep them, guard them and guide them, and do things with them. So let's pray for the people of uh, Macau. It's an open time this morning. So don't wait, get praying. So when you're ready, let's pray for your camera, please.
Children, that's probably anybody under 35. <laughs> anyway, we're all children, aren't we? Just for the children, we've got a question. What does Jesus say about children in the Bible? Do you know? Let them come to him. Uh, uh, children, I'll let you adults tell them in a minute. No? Okay, in Jeremiah, who was not always known for his gentle speaking, he said, God says, I've loved you with an everlasting love. So what's everlasting mean? Ever, come on in. Forever. Forever and ever and ever. So God is never going to stop loving you. And what did Jesus say about the children? Go on, happy tell us. What did Jesus say about children? Oh, sorry, I thought you'd said it. Yeah, he said, let the children come to me. Don't ever stop them. I want them to come and be my friend. And I want them to come. And he took them on his lap sometimes. And, and, and he loves children. Do you know, children, how special you are? Do you know that? Do you know every single one of you is special? Do you know when you were born, God looked at you as a baby and said, oh, that's so beautiful. I'm never going to have to repeat that. So even twins have got a very slight difference. So you are special. So we've got a song we're going to sing about how special the children are this morning. It's, it's quite an old song. It's one Graham Kendrick wrote, but it's called I'm Special. And then the song goes on to tell you why you're special. So this is for all the children, big and small, this morning. I'm special because God
as we're singing it, deserved. Do you think the Lord's trying to tell us something? You know, they do say in Scripture when the Lord says, verily, verily, He says, open your ears, I'm going to say it again. And I wonder if the Lord is saying to us this morning, realize this morning, undeserved, but He gave it to us. So we have that thing this morning. Two things. One, just a reminder for the, the Sunday School teachers that we have a meeting at the end of our service uh, this morning. Just grab yourself a coffee, coffee, and then we'll meet in the uh, drama room. And let's just, we're just now going to pray for the children and, and the uh, leaders and teachers as they go to do their own activity. And Heavenly Father, we just want to thank you for the privilege of having young people. The privilege of having young people that know you. The privilege that you've given to us, Lord, that we are there to be with them and to look and care for them. Lord, we pray for the, the teachers this morning that you just give them the right words to say. And Lord, that you would just cause them to open up the, the scripture before them that they might learn more of you. So as they go now, Lord, just be with them, we pray. In your name's sake of your glory. Amen. Amen. Have you ever done something that embarrasses you so much you just want to go away and hide? Am I the only one who's done that? But you know, sometimes when life is tough, we feel that the only thing we can do is hide. There's only one place that it's safe to hide. And that's under the wings of the Father who loves us so much.
feel there's some some folks here this morning who are afraid. You're fearful of what's coming. You're fearful of what you don't understand or know. For somebody, it's attached to your job. For somebody else, I think it's attached to your family. For somebody else, I think it's attached to your own doubt. Remember what Paul said, I'm deserved, but because of Jesus, you deserve his love. God wants you to know that if you go to him, if you go to him, he's the only one. Holy Spirit, would you just come now? Would you just fill the hearts of those who are afraid with a reassurance that they deserve your love? Holy Spirit, would you come now to those who are doubting? Is God real? Was Jesus just a good man? Is there such a thing as the Holy Spirit? Could you move into their hearts and their minds or find a way? Only you can do it, Holy Spirit. Help us in this busy world to know truly and not to be afraid to be still. We're going to sing, be still, but I don't want you to feel you have to sing. If you and God are having a conversation, sometimes you know when God speaks, it makes our heart pump a bit. Have you got that? Just stay where you are. Be still for the presence of the Lord.
Hold on to that moment. Hold on to the spirit. Say what you've got to say. Don't let him go. Don't turn your back. Don't stop. Keep asking. Keep talking to him. This is the moment. Don't let that moment go.
I was leading a family service in a church I was minister of. And I'd given a talk to the young people, and I'd said to them, whenever you're in trouble, call upon the name of the Lord. And there'd been this little boy that had been messing about all throughout the talk. We had another couple of songs, family songs, and again, this little boy was just being naughty, running about. I could see his dad getting angry with him, saying to him, this little boy was just being naughty. And eventually I could see it, the dad snapped. He picked the little boy up and he started to carry him out at the church. And the little boy looked at me and shouted to me, he said, Pastor, please pray for me because I'm in big trouble now. <laughs> Didn't Jesus say that out of the mouths of infants and babes, truth will be spoken? And one of the things we're going to be doing, we'll take time to implement, but certainly over the next few months of next year, we're going to implement things in our Sunday morning service, especially on Sundays when we may not have a Sunday school, which is usually the first. We're going to have children's talks and things like that. And so please pray for that because we have these young people in the church and they're so precious to the Lord, as we've been hearing this morning. And did you know that Daniel, according to some reports, was only between 13 to 15 years of age when he was taken as a slave into Babylon. And he was so young when he interpreted Nebuchadnezzar's dream. Jeremiah was only about 15 years old when God called him as a prophet. That's why you see in the first chapter of his letter, he says that, he says, I'm sovereign Lord. He said, I can't speak for you. I'm too young. And the Lord replied, don't say I'm too young. For you must go wherever I send you, and whatever I tell you. And don't be afraid of people, for I will be there to protect you. And then you see how God says to him, Look, I put my words in your mouth. And so God can use young people. He can use elderly people. All it takes, no matter how young or how old we are, all it takes is a heart willing to say, Lord, use me. Your will be done. And God reveals us. Our text today is John chapter 10, verses 22 to 42. And just remember what Jesus had said in the, in the preceding statements, in verses 20 and 21, where it said that many of them said, He has a demon and is mad. Why do you listen to him? Others said, these are not the words of one who has a demon. Can a demon open the eyes of the blind? And that reading we had earlier from John chapter 15. If you read on from that, when it talks about us being chosen by God, Jesus said, if the world hates you, remember that it hated me first. The world would love you as its own if you belong to it, but you are no longer part of the world. I chose you to come out of the world so it hates you. And there's a good tension in the Bible between the aspect of God choosing us, but also our own free will. But just think about that. They called Jesus demonically demented because he had called them thieves, robbers, and hired hands. And because they were not the true shepherds to the people of Israel, the Pharisees. And Jesus and the apostles warned us Christians that such people will find their way into Christian churches. And you look at the book of Jude, and it tells us that these people will be like clowns without water. And oh my goodness, I believe we're seeing that in Christianity today so much. Have you seen how many priests are leaving the Church of England? Have you seen how many priests are getting out of this country? How many men and women of God, if they have the financial means, are leaving the UK because they are saying that number one will be soon be cancelled, or number two, we generally feel that we will be stabbed or killed because of our waste. What's happening in the UK is very similar to what was happening to Jesus here. Demonically demented people don't go around doing good, they are destructive. And this is what Jesus is pointing out to them with this plot to kill him. Well, why are you doing this? 
What have I done that has caused you to take these actions against me? And you'll see it actually what he said. And as we read our text, and Jesus promises three things in this text. Three things that are so relevant for us as Christians today. I want to see if you can spot them as we read our text. And this isn't a test because I'll be telling you what they are. But let's read from John chapter 10, verses 22 to 42. Now it was the feast of dedication in Jerusalem, and it was winter. And Jesus walked in the temple in Solomon's porch. Then the Jews surrounded him and said to him, How long do you keep us in doubt? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. And Jesus answered them, I told you, and you do not believe me. The works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me. But you do not believe, because you are not of my sheep. As I said to you, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. My Father, who has given them to me, is greater than all. And no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father are one. And there's renewed efforts to stone Jesus. And the Jews took up stones against, again to stone him. Jesus answered them, Many good works I have shown you from my Father. For which of those works do you stone me? The Jews answered him, saying, For a good work we do not stone you, but for blasphemy, and because you, being a man, make yourself God. <coughs> Jesus answered them, Is it not written in your law? I said you are gods. If he called them gods to whom the word of God came, and the scripture cannot be broken, do you say of him whom the Father sanctified and sent into the world, you are blaspheming, because I said, I am the Son of God. If I do not do the works of my Father, do not believe me. But if I do, though you do not believe me, believe the works, that you may know and believe that the Father is in me, and I am him. Therefore they sought again to seize him, but he escaped out of their hand. And listen to these two verses, we'll come on to these as well. And he went away again beyond the Jordan, to the place where John was baptised at first, and there he stayed. Then many came to him and said, John performed no sign, but all the things that John spoke about this man were true. And many believed in him there. Now remember, Jesus has been talking about being the good shepherd and his sheep. And this is actually a few months afterwards, about two months afterwards, when he was having this conversation. What were the three things Jesus promised to his sheep, to those who followed him? The first was eternal life to all who accepted him as Master and Lord. That is the promise of Jesus. That he would become their good shepherd, they would hear his voice, he would know them, and they would know him. And as they follow him, he gives them eternal life. Do you hear the voice of the good shepherd this morning? If you follow him, you have eternal life. You don't need to be afraid of death. Yes, the process of death may not be something we look forward to. But the other side of it, Jesus says, do not be afraid. I give them eternal life. But the question is, does he know you? Do you know him? Are you following him? Because this was a promise to his sheep. The second was a life that would know no end. Whenever I conduct a funeral, and I've done more than I can count, hundreds over the years I've been in ministry, I always say the same thing if it's a Christian funeral, that death is not the end for a real Christian. It's just the doorway to a new beginning. We survive our own funerals. The body, the shell, is there in the coffin. But what did the Apostle Paul say? To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And that one day our spirits will be in heaven one day we will receive a physical resurrection. Let's read 1 Corinthians 15. We will receive a physical resurrection. 
just like Jesus received. And that's what he was saying, a life that would know no end. Eternal life is just a continuation of this life. The body goes, but the spirit goes to be in the presence of the Lord. And what's the third promise Jesus made? Eternal life was secure. Nobody or nothing can snatch his people from his hand. It does not mean you won't experience sorrow, suffering, or even death in this life. But at that moment when death comes, we will be conscious of the everlasting arms of the good shepherd. Death cannot snatch us out of his hands. Nothing can. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all. No one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father are one. Now, I'm not going to ask for any volunteers, just in case I accidentally hurt you. If you go home, Pastor Sean hurt me with the church service. It would have been purely accidental. But my eldest was a Sunday school this morning, as I'd ask her to help me with this illustration. If she was to come up this morning and to give me her hand, I could, hold, I could hold her hand. She wouldn't be able to snatch it from out of me. Why? Because I'm stronger than her. I'm holding on to her. If she held on to me, I could easily snatch my hand out of her. Because I'm stronger than her. And that's what Jesus is saying. He says, I'm so strong, nobody can snatch you out of my hands. It's impossible. So think of the illustration. The illustration is not us holding on to him. Jesus flips it around. He says, I am the one holding on to you. Isn't that wonderful? And he talks about two persons here, the Father and himself. And later he talks about the third person of the Holy Spirit. And the word one here, I don't like giving Greek lessons on a Sunday morning, but sometimes it's important. But the Greek word here is not masculine, it's Newton, so it means function. So when he says, I and the Father are one, he's talking about we have the same purpose, we have the same function. And what's the same function? The Father and the Son are holding on to the sheep that have been given to Jesus. Who does that refer to? That's you and that's I. That's why we are eternally secure in Christ. Because Jesus said, nobody can snatch you out of my hands. Read Romans chapter 8. We're not going to read it during the new term this morning, but it tells us about the things that cannot separate us from the love of God shown through Jesus Christ. Not angels, not demons, not life, not death. Nothing, the Apostle Paul wrote. Now just to give you a bit of context about the Feast of Dedication, which it mentions here, because this was a couple of months later after Jesus had been talking about the end of the shepherd. It was a feast called Hanukkah, which Jewish people still celebrate today. And you can read it in the first book of Maccabees. And if you say, well, that's the Apocrypha, there's nothing wrong with Christians reading the Apocrypha. It's history, but it's not inspired word of God. So we don't read the Apocrypha and say, well, these are the very words of God. You can read it as a history book. And it tells the history how the Jewish people came up with this feast. That prior to the year 165 BC, the Jewish people in Judea were living under the rule of the Greek kings, kings of Damascus. And during this time, one of them, a man called Antiochus Epiphanes, he was a Greco-Syrian king. He invaded Israel, took control of the temple in Jerusalem, and forced the Jewish people to abandon their worship of God, their holy customs, the reading of the Torah. He set up Greek gods, including the image of Zeus in the temple. He sacrificed a pig on the altar, and he made all of the Jewish people bow down to their gods. And some of them wouldn't, so some of them rebelled. And you read all of this history in the Apocrypha, in the book of Maccabees. And a small group of Jewish people actually overcame these oppressors. And a miraculous event happened once they cleansed the temple out. They found a small jar of oil, which had only have lasted about one day. And they lit the menorah, the seven branch candle, in the temple again. And they said it lasted eight days until they could actually get more oil to light it. 
And they bowed down because they said, oh God is a God of miracles, look what he has done. The oil, oil didn't run out. And that's what this feast was about. And obviously soon after the Greeks, the Romans had come, they were still under occupation. And so the identity of Jesus is questioned. And the Jewish people are confronting him, asking if he is the Messiah. We do need to be wise as Christians. Do you realize that Jesus has only directly told people that he was the Messiah twice so far in the book of John, when he said, yes, I am the Messiah. That was to the Samaritan woman, and that was also to the man born blind. And they were both private revelations he gave to them. If he had said publicly, I am the Messiah, the Romans would have equated that with being the king, the Christ, and of course, there would have been a lot of political turmoil, which we see when Jesus eventually did do that. That's why he was crucified. But Jesus said to them, when they asked him if he is the Christ, he said, I've already told you. And he had told them in many different ways. If you look at John's Gospel, he told them, he said, I am the one who came from heaven. He had said, whoever believes in me has eternal life. He said, I am a unique son of God. I will judge humanity. He said, all should honor me just as they honor God the Father. I'm not giving you the chapter of reference. You can look up yourselves for every one of these. He says, the Hebrew scriptures of the Old Testament, they speak of me. He said, I perfectly reveal God the Father. I always please God and never sin. He said, I am uniquely sent from God. He had said, before Abraham was, I am. He said, I am the son of man prophesied by Daniel. He said, I will raise myself from the dead. I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the door. I am the rivers of living water. I am the good shepherd. He had told them many, many times who he was. But the trouble is, the fault was not in his words. We heard it this morning. They had a hearing problem. <coughs> they couldn't hear what he was saying to them. And Jesus said, well, that's because you don't belong to me. So you're not able to understand and hear what I say. Did you know churches can have hearing problems? That's why the Holy Spirit, or Jesus speaking to each church in the book of Revelation, said, He that has ears to hear, let them hear what the Holy Spirit is saying to the churches. Because remember, Jesus said, They will know my voice. God has not stopped speaking today. He still speaks through his Holy Spirit. We have to hear. He speaks through his word. He speaks through the ministry of preaching, of teaching, of prophecy, of tongues, of interpretation of tongues, and all the different ways in the scripture that he says he will speak. But then he talks about his deeds. He says, let my deeds speak for themselves, because I do them in my Father's name, and they bear witness of me. The reason these people didn't respond to him was because there was no relationship. And Jesus said, I've repeatedly told you who I am. He said, I've shown you miracles as proof, but because you are not my sheep, you cannot see what the Father is doing or hear what the Spirit is saying. Let me ask you a question. Do you see the hand of God at work in your life, in this church? It's amazing to me, there's a word in the New Testament which is used quite often, and it's a Greek word called mysterium, which means mystery. And that word mystery, when you look at it, what it means is that something that was not able to be understood, but now, after the coming of Christ, has been revealed by him and his Holy Spirit. It talks about the mystery of iniquity. It talks about the mystery of lawlessness. It talks about the mystery of godliness. It talks about the mystery of Israel. It talks about the mystery of the church. And it says that God, that Jesus has now revealed these things. But the world still cannot see it. Their minds are blinded by the God of this world. Isaiah in chapter 35 verse 6 says, talking about when the Messiah would come, then the eyes of the blind shall be opened, and the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped. 
Then the lame shall leap like a deer, and the tongue of the dumb sing. For the water shall bear forth in the wilderness, and streams in the desert. Every miracle of Jesus was proof the Messiah had come. And every word of his was a promise of what he would and he could do. Remember those three promises. He promised to give eternal life to all who accepted him as master and Lord. He would give a life that would know no end. And the gift of eternal life was secure. So have you given your life to Jesus this morning? If not, do so. Whether you're here or watching online, put your hand in the hands of him who has promised so much. Walk with him because you'll find the power and the presence and the peace available is absolutely incredible. I'm not going to give the personal details because I don't have the permission of, of the people involved, but it's not people from this church. In fact, it's people who don't go to church. Well, they asked me to pray for them during a very difficult situation they was going through this week. And they contacted me afterwards to say we felt such peace because I said to them, I prayed that the peace of the Lord will be with you. And they said, it's incredible. They said, we feel this peace. We just felt it. And I think God has answered the prayers. They said, we hope this peace will continue. I've not had the chance to speak to them yet. Well, you need to top it up yourself then, don't you? Speak to the Father yourself. We'll start to draw to a close because this opposition against Jesus, and I think it's very, very important, I just cover Psalm 82. When you look at here, which is what the reference is, when Jesus said, is it not written in your law? I said, you are God. The reason I'm drawing this out is because at the moment, especially in the Word of Faith movement, there is such a blasphemous ungodly doctrine. In fact, it's a doctrine of demons that is going about, where it says, you are like gods. That you are literally like little gods. You'll hear it. That's not what Jesus was saying. He was using a metaphor here based on Psalm 82, which when you look at it, it says, I said you are gods, and all of you are children of the Most High, but you shall die like men and fall like the princes. And it's talking about God's judgment of them. It's talking about people who were standing in the office of a judge that God had appointed them to, saying that you as a judge, you have the power over life, men and women. You've not exercised that power correctly, so therefore I will bring judgment. But that's the context when Jesus was saying this in Psalm 82. He was not saying that we are like God's. We're sons and daughters of God. We're in the image of the Father. But you see these horrible teachings going around which, around which say, it's gone to so far to say, well actually you don't need God because you are God yourself. I'm not encouraging you to listen to it on YouTube, but this is in the word of faith with which you'll hear it. But they're saying, you don't need God because the words out of your mouth have the same power and authority he has. That's not what Jesus was saying here. Jesus makes an argument from the greater to the less. But let me just close by reading the last two, three verses. And he went to go away again beyond the Jordan to the place where John was baptizing at first. And there he stayed. Then many came to him and said, John performed no sign, but all the signs that John spoke about this man were true. And many believed in him there. So the people in Jerusalem have tried to stone him. They couldn't. They tried to arrest him. They had a plot to kill him. They couldn't. So Jesus goes back beyond the Jordan. And these verses, I think, are very, very significant, especially for us today as Christians. Because Jesus goes back to where it had begun three years earlier, where John had baptised him. For three years, Jesus had been wandering north and south, preaching, teaching, and healing. And the big question everybody was asking is, who is he? And think about this, John did no miracles, as it says there. No crippled person walked, because John prayed for them. No blind person saw. 
No deaf person heard. John never walked on the water. He never stilled a storm. He never fed a multitude from a few loaves and fishes. All he'd done was speak about Jesus and point people to him. He was a voice who talked about Jesus and told people to him. Now, I believe God can do miracles, but I believe that he's very select through whom he will do them through at times and when he will do them. Think about what happens today. If we see a miracle, what do we want to do? We want to advertise it to the whole world. You see so many men and women in pulpits who then want to have these mass meetings, a healing meeting, because this is God's man or woman who is going to be used greatly by him for healing. What did Jesus often do? He were true when the miracles happened. I don't doubt God does miracles. I've seen him do it. And I'm happy for him to do it. But I realise that our task as a church, as Christians, we are primarily called to be a voice, to tell people about who Jesus is. And we will get some opposition and hate from the world as we do so, because Jesus warned us this would happen. But that's what I want to encourage us all with, that we need to be a voice. And as we do a voice, people will be healed, God will touch people, miracles will happen. But I'm quite content to leave that to him. And when it happens, we will rejoice. Our task as the church is to point people to Jesus. And as this world gets darker and darker, as this country, and it is, the United Kingdom is descending into a demonic darkness. And much of the church has become spineless, cowardly, weak, and will not speak up. And they may sound like harsh words, but it is the truth of what's happening in the United Kingdom at the moment. But my Christianity, my follower of Jesus, is not a spineless, cowardly one. It's one where we can tell the world who Jesus is. We'll be a voice for him. And if the world hates us for that, bear in mind, it does so because it hated him first because he has brought truth into our world of deception. He has brought truth into a world where the father of lies, according to him, is in control of this world. So there will be conflict between truth and falsehood. But let's be a voice for Jesus. Amen. Amen.
No, it doesn't work, does it? You know, we couldn't have planned that any better, could we? If we wanted to, we'd have found it and said, let's have the word deserved, and let's put it in. But we didn't do that. But God is speaking. He wants us to realise. We don't deserve it. But He has given it to us. And that's who we are this morning. And that's what we are. We are so precious in Him and to Him. Yeah. Just want to take two seconds to remind you that next Sunday, Francis Pidigu is with us. So remember that next Sunday. I can remind you as well about the working party on the 22nd and the 28th. Um, it's all in the news mail. Have a read through. Uh, there's some work that we need to do. And so we need to come together and get that done. Okay, before we just go off to um, tea and coffee, let's just pray. Heavenly Father, we just want to thank you again that we're not deserving of you. But Lord, our hearts are so full of thankfulness and gratefulness to realise what you've given to us and what you've done for us. So Lord, as we leave this place and go to a second home, rest and abide amongst us, we pray. In your name's sake. Amen. Amen. Amen.